Welcome to Verify in Fields, the Millwork Podcast. Your host, Jacob Edmond, CEO of Duckworks, will be interviewing experts in the industry to bring you insights and knowledge about the latest trends, techniques, and challenges in millwork. Whether you're a seasoned professional or just starting out, this podcast is for you. So sit back, relax, and join us as we explore the world of millwork. Here's Jacob. Hey, John. I appreciate you joining me here. This will actually be our, I think, uh, fifth episode once we publish this. So I'm excited to have you on. John Boston is general manager of Caseworks in Hudson, North Carolina, right near Hickory. And uh, John, you and I have uh, followed each other. I've followed you. I think, was it 2020? We were in the 40 Under 40 Woodworking Networks together. Yeah. Going way back at the beginning or before COVID times. And uh, you were one of the first uh, people in the industry, actually, that reached out to me when I went out on my own with Duckworks last year. And I've always been appreciative of that and wanted to talk today. Our topic is developing managers in the millwork industry. And I know that's definitely something that's near and dear to your heart and something you, you've invested a lot in. And so I think you're the perfect person to talk about it. But before we get started on that, I wanted to know if you could tell us a little bit about your background, how you started in this industry and the path to your current role at Caseworks. Sure. So I'm, I guess, in the 23rd year of my career in construction and cabinets, architectural millwork. So I started halfway through my senior year in high school in an internship and part of it was an apprenticeship program to where I left school at lunchtime and went to work for a local general contractor. And he, we did residential work. He did pretty much everything from layout and footings to framing, pouring concrete, hanging drywall, insulation, shingles, everything throughout the whole process. And so I worked with him for two or three years and then moved into commercial construction or some light commercial and residential. I was in that as in a superintendent role. I use the term superintendent lightly for that season of my life because I was 22, 23 years old at that point, dumped out on a commercial job site and had never even been on a commercial job site. And so they were like, here's the plans. Here's a truck. Good luck. I learned that relationships were valuable when everybody on that site probably had 20 years in the industry on top of me. So that was really good experience. The first contractor that I worked for also built cabinets for all of the houses that we built and we would do just out of his two car garage. And so I learned basic cabinetry from him and my grandfather was in furniture and we always had a woodwork, small woodworking shop when I was growing up. And so I've been around it my whole life, but doing it as a career started out more on the construction side, but learned cabinetry there and really had a passion for it. And the company that I was working, that second company I was working for shut down unexpectedly. And I was doing some cabinet work on the side and I rolled right into being self-employed with no real no plans or money put back to start in business for yourself. I had no idea what any of that was about, but I knew that I had some jobs lined up on the side and I didn't really know why not just to turn that into to full-time work. So that was 2005. And then probably the, the worst stretch in the construction industry to, for anybody was the next five years. And so that that's where I got, I think my master's in business education but that, that came at the cost of almost starving my family to death. Those were hard years, hard lessons learned. And so over those five years between 2005 and 2010, I did a lot of cabinet work, had a cabinet shop, small. We did mostly residential work. I did a good bit of framing and turnkey houses, just overall construction. We had a, a field crew that did that type of work too. And in 2010, I was dead broke and didn't really have any other options and I got offered a job to get back into construction. And so I took another superintendent job and kind of served as the liaison with them for cabinets across all their projects to an internal liaison with the mill workers that we were working with and got that program put together. And then some other economic events happened with that supplier and they were going to go away. And so 
I went to the owners and said, we're getting ready to lose our source for cabinets. And I think that we should either bring it in house because I don't know of another local source. We should either bring it in house and just try to do it small scale and do what we can do to serve your jobs. Or if you're interested, maybe we could run this like a business and start something, start another cabinet shop and go at it and do your work and maybe turn it into something good. And so that's where Caseworks came from. So that was 2014 when, when that transition happened and they got on board and we ended up buying equipment, buying a shop, renovating it and starting to run production in 2015. There was me and one other guy, Billy, our engineering manager here. We started Caseworks together and it's owned by our general contractors that I was working for. So they financed the deal and we got started. And so fast forward to where we're at now, we're focused more on doing commercial work, architectural mill work. We still do a little bit of residential, but not very much. Our owners are still general contractors and they build some houses. And so we can't tell them no, but outside of that, (laughs) we do a pretty good job saying no to the other residential work. And we're currently at 28 employees and on track to do around $6 million, five and a half, $6 million in revenue this year. Our shop is about 20,000 square feet. And then we've got an additional 20,000 square foot warehouse for where we store our finished goods. We try to do a lot of pre-build and store. Yep. Yeah, I've been up to your facility and it's a great facility, really nice. And I like the way, something I'd never seen before, the way you set up your rollers and your conveyor system was really awesome to see. So as we dive into today's topic, developing managers and leaders in this industry, I wanted to start and get your thoughts on the state of leadership and management from your perspective in the industry today. And where do you see the gaps and needs as a whole for the industry? I would say I've observed both ends of the spectrum. Just as a generalization, I think that there are a lot of firms who have owners who have managed them pretty much on their own or with a very small management team, very centralized command. They're making maybe 95% of the major decisions in those companies, at least the ones that I've been exposed to. And then there's the the other side of it, which I would say we're more on to where there's, they're, I say, structured like a business and they are putting together, those companies are putting together a more diverse management team, making group decisions. And I think that the biggest difference in that or where that comes from is that the old school way of thought and the centralized command, those are people who never really planned to be in business for themselves. They probably came up in the shop and a really excellent builder, and maybe they didn't like working for somebody else or an opportunity presented itself for them to take ownership. And they've really never worked in any other organizations. And so they only know what they know. And then I got introduced. I haven't worked in a lot of different shops and I've had to figure out a lot of this on my own, but what I observed from some other shops being involved with AWI and things like that are, I gravitated more toward the people who had no cabinet experience and were buying cabinet businesses and putting together a leadership structure or a leadership team. And really they didn't know anything about how things need to happen. So they depended a lot on those managers and their experience. And so I, I lean more toward that model and that's how we've tried to grow Caseworks. No, I think that's good. We didn't touch on something you mentioned there yet, but you are also involved in the North Carolina chapter or the Carolinas chapter of AWI. You're president of it or chair of it? Currently the president of the Carolinas chapter AWI. Yep. Yep. And also you guys are energy users. So I know you're very involved in the energy user community and stuff, even though you mentioned like you haven't worked yourself in a lot of shops, you are very much involved in interacting with a lot of other companies in this industry in a multiple different kind of avenues through those in particular that I'm aware of at least. Yeah. And that's what I found tremendous value, both in energy and in AWI. And I would probably say more so in energy, just because I think that most of the energy family are more progressive. They, you have to, for energy to work, you have to buy into the idea of how a business 
should function and change management. And that that's a really great group to be involved in. And I've learned a lot and made a lot of great connections through both well, those organizations. And they're by nature, I mean, they're a software company and ERP company software for the this industry specifically. Everything they do is around the business Correct. practices, the processes by nature, whereas AWI is first and foremost more about the products we make. You talked a little bit about your path, which I think is honestly very common for a lot of people in this industry. Let's talk a little bit about what the typical path to management or leadership looks like in millwork. And you touched on this a little bit, but a lot of times it's not planned. It's not something that is orchestrated or architected in any way. It's out of necessity or just, hey, there's nobody else. And I either am a business owner or I need somebody I, that to help fill this role and you get pulled, the business owner pulls that person in because they're the most tenured or most experienced. But that also leads to some of what we're seeing today, which is a lot of underdeveloped leaders and managers are under equipped. I'd say this industry is like a lot of people say, and I'm true of, it's true for me as well. Nobody kind of goes to school and says, oh, I'm going to go into the millwork industry unless you go to Pitt State maybe. (laughs) But a lot of us find ourselves here through life circumstances. And as such, there's not a lot of opportunity where it's like, hey, I'm going to go and be mentored and coached to be a millwork leader, to be a millwork manager. Talk a little bit about that and how how the typical path kind of leads to what we see today. Yeah, I would say the majority of leadership in the millwork industry are people who started on the sawdust. They wanted to do construction or manufacturing work, and they were good at it. And so they've been promoted up through and find themselves in a leadership role. And most of who they were coming up under probably weren't pouring a lot of training and stuff into them and maybe weren't a good manager at all. So I would say a lot of the example that's been set and for people as is not positive. It's, I would say the generation or two ahead of me coming up were not gentle teachers. They were a lot of throwing things and cuss words and you learned um, the hard way. And, and then you've got the people who are entering the industry from other businesses and stuff that I think are having a positive impact on leadership in general. And then with what AWI and some of the other organizations are doing, they're recognizing that's an issue. At the recent AWI spring leadership, they talked a lot of the conversations were about continuation of businesses and what that looks like over the next 10 years and maybe even five years that there's just not people who are ready to step into to those roles and it's a it's an opportunity for people outside the industry to to buy in and i think we're going to see a lot of changes come in and and how these businesses are run and if you look at the awi cost of doing business survey i i think that proves that the majority of our industry are not good business people. They're not good leaders. I think last year it was the average profitability was or operating margin was 0.63%. So we're a break-even industry. There's just as an average. And so there's a lot of opportunity. Right. Yeah, for sure. And I think, you know, just to I clarify for our listeners, I wouldn't, you're not a somebody that's advocating against the craftsman or kind of somebody who comes from the sawdust path. But what we're bringing to light and discussing is that there's not a lot of opportunity for people that are getting poured into them of what it means to be a leader on top of the craftsman side of things. And so that it is a different set of skills that you know, and two business in, in our industry today, like has evolved, right? Like 50 years ago to run a millwork business run, you were likely a smaller shop yep. and two, like you were out there running the business. You were the craftsman first who grew your business. And now there's a lot more that goes into that. We have software, we have a lot of different people from different backgrounds that it takes to run a business. And I think and to survive, you, you likely have to have a larger operation, right? We've got more larger business scale businesses. You mentioned you guys are five to six million and that 28 people. So that's how much time do you spend out there looking through parts versus talking and communicating with people and managing people and then running your business? I imagine that that looks different than it would have 20 years ago. Yeah, for me, I would say the first 
three to five years in business, I was still involved in a lot of, it, it went from when we first started and only had a few people to where I was working on the shop floor during the day, going out with install crews at night. I was doing all of our field measuring. I was helping engineer jobs, you know, all doing a little bit of everything and gradually stepped out of those positions and grew those teams to where the last thing that I was probably holding on to was project management. And now I'm rarely even involved in the project management details. I, I certainly don't touch cabinet parts in the shop or get involved in installations. And I would say 80% of my focus is on the five people in my management team, the key people who are making those decisions for those different departments. But those are my touch points in the organization. And most of my focus on them is not on how they do their job, but it's on developing them as leaders because they already know how to do what needs to be done. It's how do we get other people to get on board and create alignment throughout the whole organization. Yeah, that that's a great point there that I want to dive into a little bit. But what you just laid out is a lot of what your strategy and kind of methodology is behind being a leader in your organization, right? You mentioned, hey, you've got a management team of five people that you focus on and you've slowly over time backed away from a lot of the individual contributor roles and, and the nuts and bolts of what you do. And now you're focused on leading your managers. And so I would venture to say in my experience and in yours as well, there's a lot of business owners who don't manage that way. Right. And fr from my experience, a lot of the time, a business can only scale as far as that owner is capable of managing everything. Yeah. And they hit a ceiling, right? Yep. Of, okay, everybody reports to them. They're involved in the sales and estimating and project management of every project. And there's only so much one person can do with that. And yep. so what you just outlined very aptly in a short few sentences was you have evolved to where you manage your managers and you spend your time with a small circle of leaders who are then managing the business for you, right? Yep. And a lot of people are probably listening to this and saying, well, that sounds strange, but that sounds nice. Or maybe there's business owners that are saying, oh, that's too good to be true. Where'd you find those five people? Or maybe are jaded and like sarcastically, hey, they're probably screwing up your business while you're not looking. But there's strategy to that, and it doesn't happen overnight, I imagine. How did you go about getting from where you were, where you mentioned you were involved in a lot of things, to now you've got a group of five that you trust and rely on and delegate to? I did it wrong a lot, <laughs> is how I got. That's the short answer of how I got to where I'm at today. I did it wrong a, a lot of the time. And I say that because the misconception of most, and this part's not a misconception. So if you become a business owner or at the top of an organization, you probably can do almost every function of that business better than the people who you hire to do it, if that's all you had to do. The problems come in where you still think that you can do it better than everybody, but you can only devote 5% of your effort toward that. And so, yeah, you might be the greatest project manager, but if that project management is only getting 5 to 10% of your attention, then you're not doing that as well as someone who is only doing that and they do it 80% as good as you do. There's different, I don't know the framework and the different rules out there that people say, someone that can do it at 70 to 80% of what I can do it to the same level of what I can do it is going to do a better job overall than me operating in a minimal capacity in that role. So what I recognized is that as I tried to hand off these things in leadership and still keep my hands in them, I became the chaos. I became the barrier. I became what was holding us back because people were constantly waiting on me. I became the bottleneck of the organization because I couldn't possibly wrap my head and my hands around everything that we were trying to do. So what I learned was that once you get the right person in there, what you got to do is pour into them, but not get in their way. So you go to them and you help them, you coach them, you give them the things that they need. And then you let them do what they're doing and they're going to mess up and they're going to just, I would mess up. Everybody's going to mess up. And I don't think you focus on those things. You focus on, okay, how do we not make that same mistake again? And a lot of people that find themselves in those management positions, 
it's because they were a high performer. They were really good at doing one job. So it's, hey, here's you're a great cabinet builder. So here's you five other cabinet builders. I want you to oversee that department. They got no idea how to oversee that department. They probably, in a lot of cases, they certainly don't know how to talk to somebody because if they're the high performer, they've been stuck over here in the corner at their bench doing whatever they wanted to do and not talking to anybody. And when you put them over a group or a team, then they don't really know how to manage that team. They know what maybe the end product, what they should be getting out, but they don't have the tools to be able or the mental teaching to to be able to know how to approach that management position. So that's where, as I've transitioned out of those positions, I learned that my job was to equip them to be those leaders and managers, not to tell them how to do how to manage their people or their process, whatever it was. Yep. No, that that's perfectly, that's very well said. And what you mentioned about a lot of managers and most of them are high performers as individual contributors and they get promoted as to be a leader or manager or supervisor, right? But just because they were a high performer as an individual contributor doesn't mean that they're, they know how to teach or manage other people to be as high performing as they were. And that really is the trick of management, right? Is okay, what do I know how to do? Can I replicate that and help somebody else get there? And sometimes that's where you're getting into the soft skills of, okay, there's different personalities. Each people, each person may have different strengths or weaknesses. And are they capable of a evaluating that and b communicating effectively in a way that yields those results? You mentioned that you did it wrong many ways to get to where you're at today, right? So what are some of the more common struggles that you've seen in the process of developing these leaders and maybe as they've gone from that individual contributor role to a manager under you? I, I think for, from my perspective, from my side of it, as I was stepping out of those roles, the mistakes that I made and the, what kept me from being able to grow in new roles would, was holding on to, or trying to stay involved in things that, that I was that I had been doing previously, just straddling the fence. And, and I think that becomes a barrier for other people too, if they can't really understand that new role and be dedicated and focused to that. The mentality around always try to be replacing, work into a position to, or working yourself out of a job. That, mm -hmm. that really resonated with me, but I didn't know what it meant early on. Working yourself out of a job, you're like, what happens when there's nothing when I've given that role to somebody else. And what I recognized is that every time I worked myself out of a job, there was more higher level things to be doing. And so I've adopted the mentality and try to share with our management team that what you should be doing and focusing on are things that only you are capable of doing. If there's somebody else in the organization that can do it, you should probably support them and make sure they've got what they need, but your focus should remain on things that only you can do. And so that helps you stay out of the weeds. Yep. No, that, that's very good, good advice. And I've always noticed that that becomes a concern. One, for individual contributors there, they've gotten to a place of comfort. Okay, I know my job now, I know how to do it well, and I know that I can be successful at this. And you're taking them into new uncharted territory out of their comfort zone. So that in of itself is a struggle, but then you're now putting them in a role where they want to gravitate towards, okay, if I have somebody now that I'm responsible for and they're not doing a good job at something that I used to do and I know how to do, their instinct is to go do the task for them, do it themselves, right. which takes them out of that leadership role and back into individual contributor role. And so that's one of the, especially engineering managers, I see this a lot, or even in the shop, right? Rather than going in, addressing the person, addressing the issue of, hey, you made this mistake or you're not doing this the right way. How do we correct that and allow you still to, to learn from this and get the job done, the work that needs to be done? It's, I'm going to go and do this after hours or do it for them and nothing improves. Right. And I think that there's comfort in that of, hey, I'm always needed because I'm the only one who knows how to do this thing well. But there's also a lost opportunity there, like you said, that because there's always higher level things that you could be doing when you free up your time. And so that fear, I always try to remind my people, I have had this conversation recently of, hey, the goal is 
basically, like you said, work yourself out of a job by developing the people under you, the resources you've been given by your company, teach them to take things off your plate. And as you have capacity, you're able to do the same for your boss or for the business. What else can I now redirect my efforts and free time to that is going to improve the business? And maybe it's learning, maybe it's taking something from your manager or your next level up, but there's always more work to be done. And if there's not more work to be done, there's more work to be sold and to allow the business to grow. So I think that is a huge opportunity that a lot of times isn't framed that way or people, you know, are lost. It's lost on them because they're focused on what they're losing. Yeah. Yeah. And I recently went through, I would say recently over the last, I'm going to say the last year, I got to a point to where I had really good managers in place and I got bored. I found myself sitting in the office on some days, just staring at the computer screen. I had went in a short period of time from getting 60 to 80 emails a day, 60 to 80 phone calls a day, traveling a thousand miles a week to get around to different jobs, that kind of thing, to maybe a half a dozen emails a day, almost no phone calls. And it's, what am I doing? Am I actually contributing? I probably need to be doing something different. The company don't need me anymore. And so it, I've explored some other opportunities and things. But what I found is that the little things that I was doing to support those people, when I stepped away a little bit and became absent, that that they still needed that leadership. They needed the part, even though I didn't feel as needed. There, there's still a what you're bringing to the table there in that organization is needed. So the fear of working yourself out of a job probably is not going to happen. Right. Uh, just by being available as well and may not yeah. be full time every, they have something every five minutes, but you're there when they need it. And I think that's something that I've had that conversation with managers and I struggle with it myself as well. Uh, if you have that, you get so used to the firefighting mode of, okay, I'm going a million miles an hour that when things are running well, it's like, Hey, how do I work in this zone? What am I here for? But Ultimately, even on a smaller scale, like a weekly basis, I always would tell my engineering managers, hey, you should start the week delegating everything. Tuesday afternoon, you've got nothing to do. Yeah. But by the end of the week, all that stuff you've delegated, the issues start to pile back up. Like, hey, this I can't finish this because I'm waiting on this information. Okay, let me take that back off your plate. Your job as the manager is to go remove the obstacles, resolve the issues, and keep your people moving on work they can move on. And so... You have those waves of, okay, I've got a ton of stuff. Now let me go resolve, delegate, distribute, and now I have nothing again. And I'm ready for those issues to come back that I'm able to jump on and address, which that in itself is a lot of times that's your responsibility yeah. and your value to the organization as, as the leader. So what are some skills or traits that someone might have if people are looking for, what, hey, who should I manage or how do I go about finding who to promote to be a manager or hire. And a lot of times it might be aptitude that you're looking for. So what are some things that you look for that says, hey, that's somebody that I want to invest in that I know I feel that I can, they're maybe not there now, but we can get them there. Yeah, I mentor in a, a, a student leadership program with the high school and did that this morning. And the curriculum that we were working on or the lesson that we talked about today was talent versus skill and the difference in that. And so to lead that, I was reflecting on this. And when I read some of your notes and prepping, I thought that's going to be really fitting because the, the talents are things that you're born with and, you know, what you're good at, what you enjoy doing. And so when I entered this career into construction and cabinet building, I think that one of the talents that I had was being able to visualize the end product. I've just always been able to see that and then back into the plan. So drawings made sense. The means and methods by which we built things made sense to me because the structure of things made sense to me. And I could picture that. And as that's evolved, what I've recognized then is the skills are things that you grow to build that. So early on in my career, I focused on being a better carpenter and cabinet building those skills and how to use tools and those things as my I think that what that did, though, is it prepped me and the skills that I've tried to hone then was more to the business side. And so I relate that same thing and it gets to your question of what I'm looking for. I want people who can see the big picture, 
who are able to step out of the details and see the big picture and then reverse engineer the steps to get there. Because those people who are really good just in the weeds, those high performers that act with, they're unable to step out and see that big picture. They might see a lot of problems and issues and be able to solve those in what they're doing. But if they can't see the bigger picture of how things come together, then they probably are not going to be that problem solver for other people because they're not, they're just going to be focused on the problem more than the solution. And so I, I think that's important in managers and people that I want to pour into are people who really can see the big picture, understand the plan, and then back into it and think through that process. No, I think that's huge. That's really good advice because a lot of times that's where maybe people who aren't capable of that, but get put in a position of leadership or management start to fall apart is one when the stress gets high and the problems start to mount up is it's, oh my gosh, I can't see the forest for the trees. I can't yep. see where we're trying to get to from where we're at. And so they can't even start to dig out of the problem or figure out a path. And somebody has to be able to see that and say, hey, look, guys, we're here and we need to get there and we have to start digging out and create a path that's going to get us from there to there. But somebody has to be able to get outside of the problem and out of the weeds to be able to do that. And a lot of times, even just mentally, it's difficult for some people to look past, OK, but I've got these obstacles right in front of me and I can't see past that. And you need those people in your organization. That, that's the engineers. That's the problem solvers who are like, hey, guys, I've got this problem and I'm the one who can see it better than anybody. You need to create space for those people to focus on that. But somebody has to be, as the leader, looking at the big picture and making sure that, hey, are we heading towards the North Star we're trying to go towards? Yeah. What are, I'll say once you've isolated this person or, or, hey, I've got somebody that we're developing you know, or I am somebody that's being developed or I've been put in a position of leadership, what are some skills or characteristics that they should aim to develop as a manager? If they maybe already got the talents, but hey, now what am I trying to develop? How can they add value by honing in on certain skills. Yeah. One of the things that I did wrong early on was include too many people. Before we, we went from no management team and me running all the departments, maybe having team leads to saying, okay, we need strategic planning and leadership in the organization. And so at 30 people, we included 10 in that strategic planning and leadership team. And we met and we brought up a lot of good issues, but we didn't really solve any of them. It was too many opinions. It was pulling too many people off the work, that kind of thing. So what we've done now is regroup and said, no, we need key leaders. And so it for that, that forced me to go back and say, okay, who really needs to be involved in leadership here? And then how do we tier that so that everybody is developing from where they're at and they're able to grow? And so what, what has worked well for me has been to to take those key people in. It started with three, and now we're up. We've added two others in there, or really one other in there. So four, include myself, would be the five for the management team. And so what I started doing was having one-on-one -on -one meetings with those folks and really just coaching them on, I was probably only a couple steps ahead of them in most of what they're needing to do because I've worked myself out of those positions pretty quickly over the last couple of years. So what I focused on coaching them on was just solving the problems in front of them in the same methods and in the same order that I solved them. And then I got to that point to where I'm backed out of all the weeds, they're in it and they can't see or comprehend how they could ever get out of it. And so I start just keep pouring that into them and giving them the tools that have worked for me and strategies and those things. And then through that, what I found is that I grew when I'm trying to coach them. So I'm identifying their issues or they're bringing new issues to light. And so it's these whole different set of scenarios that they're encountering and we're working through that. But also as they're moving along it, we've applied the same thing to, their key folks under them, they start having those same types of meetings. And so they're not trying to get them to where I'm at. They're trying to get them into doing the same things. And so it's that whole coaching mentality that, all right, we're going to solve these problems here. And then that port just trickles down to where then you get two or three layers deep. And those people are now having meetings one-on-one -on -one or team meetings that you've 
starting to create that alignment. So the, the really high level conversations that you're having that I'm having in those one-on-one -on -one meetings with the leadership team. Now they're having a version of that with their direct reports. And those folks are having a version of that same conversation with their direct reports. And it's making it all the way throughout the organization. And so it's, it's limiting those touch points and maintaining alignment, I think, throughout the whole organization to keep everybody on track. And naturally then everybody's growing in that. And so everybody's moving up. And when you all start moving together, then the organization just gets better. It's not, we're not pulling apart from each other. It's just, we're all growing and getting better. No, that that's great. I think definitely what you highlighted there is the one-on-one -on -one idea of direct individual meetings with your direct reports, right? Yeah. And one, I th that highlights two, you know, that I think come up a lot is one, you only have so much capacity for a certain number of one-on-ones per week, which really is directly proportional to how many direct reports you can manage. Yeah. And we always tried to keep our, the number of people that report to a manager proportional to how many one-on-ones they could support. If you start to get to where, hey, I don't have enough time to meet with everybody every week, you probably have too many people and you need to break that team up under yep. multiple owner, managers. But two is, you know, what I was talking about was, okay, how, what are some skills to develop and the idea of being capable of holding that one-on-one -on -one, when you go from an individual contributor, or even a lot of our shop work, like when you're in manufacturing and production or in the field, like the idea of a one-on-one -on -one is pretty rare. Like you have them informally, but it's usually team meetings or group meetings. Yeah. Or hey, we might have a, a huddle at the toolbox every morning or a safety meeting. But having a direct one-on-one -on -one is, a, is another level of leadership and management that one becomes much more important in those types of roles where you have project managers, you have that type of staff that are each individually contributing and interfacing with many people. And so having that dedicated time, I'm a huge proponent of weekly one-on-ones yeah. with your direct report. And a lot of times it's uncomfortable and it's awkward first starting out if you've never done it before as a manager. Yeah. And two, even just with a new person, like you guys are getting comfortable with each other, but that discipline of, hey, it's this time every day, every Friday, this time we meet and we spend an hour or we might even not spend the whole hour, but we're going to block out an hour time to where if I have something, that's when we talk about it. If you have something, that's when we talk about it to give feedback, to get feedback. And within that, I think developing the ability to, to comfortable, be comfortable giving that feedback, constructive, but critical feedback, as well as to receive it as a manager, I'd say are very important skills to hone and focus on to be a good manager. Yeah. And I think you gain a lot when you take on that structure, you gain a lot, especially if you encourage leading up and leading down and applying those same principles. So you're learning as you're leading up and I'm having one-on-ones with those other managers and leaders, then they're taking things away from my meeting. But then when they're applying those, it, it'd be pretty easy for them. I'm certainly not a seasoned leader in that I've had a tons of one-on-one -on -one or formal training in that. So I didn't probably do, didn't do a very good job at it early on. And so growing in that, I figured things out, but then their feedback too has helped me grow in that. And while they're critiquing me, they're also figuring out things for themselves. And so they're able to get some compound benefits out of then having their meetings. And another step that, that we've evolved to is when when I felt like I was plateauing and didn't know where to go, I took a high performance leadership program with a local leadership consulting group here in Hickory. And from that, that put me in a cohort where I was doing leadership training once a month with a cohort of 20 other business people and then meeting once a month with the coach, with an individual coach. And so I started growing there and applying those things back to my meetings internally and then I've just continued that executive coaching since I went through that program. And now we've got to where two other leaders here have been through, or they're actually finishing up that high performance leaders program now, and they will continue meeting with their individual coaches too. So they've each one of our management team has an individual session monthly with an hour session with an executive coach. And most of the time, I know some of the highlights of what they work on, but it's not like they're getting that and reporting to me. I learned what they're working on through my one-on-ones with them. 
but they're able to work on things with a professional coach that's a lot better at it than I am. And that can be personal or professional because I, I don't think that you can really separate those two. If you're having a hard time at home, you're going to have a hard time at work too, or vice versa. So what I've saw from that is that people's home lives, we're getting better as a team, but people's home lives are improving too. They're able to apply these same leadership principles that we're working on here to their families. And so that, I don't know that there's anything greater that we could do as leaders than influence other and improve other people's lives. That's become my mission. Life mission is just that's to awesome. improve the other people's lives. There's three things I want to highlight from that that you touched on. First is the idea that of managing up, managing down, leading up, leading down. And a lot of times as managers, right, you're, you have a manager that you're having one-on-ones with, you're working with, and then you have people under you. And in the act of those, like, you're likely thinking consciously, okay, hey, I'm asking my manager for this. I could use this from them. But if you're also actively taking that and thinking, oh, am I doing that for my people? Or is that something I could also improve on? That's, I'm constantly, I even now in consulting will work with clients in a similar way. And as I'm advising them, hey, this is what you should be doing. I'm thinking, oh, wait, am I doing this internally? Am I doing a good job of this? And so like you you mentioned on this, that there's double positive there, right? A benefit of you're benefiting your manager and you're benefiting your direct reports if you're thinking of it that way. The second thing that you touched on is you used the example of you went outside of your organization and sought out executive coaching, professional coaching for yourself. And then you offered that to your people, right? And you said, okay, because a lot of people might think, oh, I'm going to go get this. And then that's going to help me learn what I need to teach my people as opposed to what you did, which is, hey, Let me get that. I don't need to be as a leader. It's not always your job to just be the one who teaches everything. It's your job to make it available to them and ensure that they get the resources that they need. And that doesn't have to always come through you as their manager. It might be you opening and giving them resources. And hey, here is an executive coach that we're going to pay for and, and make available to you and give you time to go seek it out. I think that's huge. And a lot of times people wouldn't occur. I wouldn't have occurred to me necessarily, but there are tons of resources. And like you said, you're in Hudson, North Carolina, not exactly like one of the (laughs) largest cities in the nation, but you were able to find a resource for that, right? That's local and available to you. Yeah. And the third part, which is really related to the second, but just that as a leader, your job, one of the best things you can do that is good for your people, but also rewarding, as you mentioned for yourself is how do I identify what my people need? And how do I make it possible or available to them through whatever means possible? And sometimes that is reaching outside the organization. And sometimes it's not just, is this going to make them, is this going to be, hey, are they going to gain skills as my employee? But hey, like you said, it's all, their personal life is intertwined, especially as your leader. If you're having problems at home, it's going to affect your work life. And so you benefit, one, your company benefits, but two, just personally as a friend, you're developing a relationship with these people and you want to see them succeed at work as well as in their life and home. And those things become more and more intertwined as you really develop a relationship with your people. Yeah. And you talking there brought up two points. You asked me earlier what I look for in those leaders. <clears throat> and I struggled to, to give you many points, but I thought of two there while you were talking. Self-awareness is a huge trait that I think through all this that we're talking about and leading up, leading down, all that. If you're self-aware and you're observing other people and observing yourself, being honest with yourself, when you are falling short and you're working on that, then that really weighs heavy in making a good leader. The other thing um, that I've discovered recently is I want people who are curious. If I'm recognizing, if people are coming to me asking the same, I don't want to say stupid questions, but if they're asking questions, that I'm going to have to type in Google to give them the answer, or I'm going to have to look in the software, in the energy software to give them that answer. It's just as available to them as it is to me, but it's easier for them to ask me than it is to be curious themselves and try to solve that problem on their own. So those are the two things that I would say, in addition to forward thinking and being able to step out and see things are the self-awareness and curiosity. No, that that's huge. I think that's a great, great answer for that question. So we talked a lot about, okay, what are the skills and soft skills? What are the talents you look for aptitude? What are there any 
misconceptions or things that we could share with people that maybe haven't been in a leadership or management manager role, but they report to a manager and probably are dealing with maybe even a bad manager. What are some things that might be helpful for them? Craig Groeschel always says, I don't know if you follow him or not, but Craig Groeschel always says at his podcast, people would rather follow a leader that's always real as a re- leader who's always right. And I think that really speaks volumes. Just be real and encourage people to be real. We talked about today, we actually just wrapped up our management meeting before we started recording today. <clears throat> and that's what we talked about. We've been through a rough stretch the last couple of weeks, just hand to mouth, all the work seemed like we're being hit with struggles, machines going down, material delays. It's something all the time. And when you're operating like that, it's really easy for everybody to get focused on the problems that you're having. And what we talked about today is we really have to make a point to, even when we're fighting these battles, we have to step back and celebrate wins. We're doing a lot of things good, even though the majority of our day is putting out these fires and stuff. And that's what managers see a lot and leaders see. They're, the problems that are coming to you are the problems that, that other people don't know how to deal with. And so that, that can get to where it only feels negative and your focus becomes negative, just solving problems. But you have to be able to step back and celebrate those wins because people need an imbalance of positive. They need more positive than what they're getting negative or everybody's outlook goes negative. No, that, that makes a lot of sense. I think that definitely is very applicable. And I think, especially in this industry where too often stress can run high for long periods of time, you're on a very difficult project that just won't end or multiple projects, but being able to find that space to take a step back and be like, okay, like I've been, we've been through this or we're going to get through this and there are positives to it. And especially as leaders, it's very easy to spend all your time focusing on the problems because that's what everybody's bringing to you as opposed to the positives. Yeah. We always used to say that, especially when I was in engineering, it was like we our goal was to have a job, get com- get done and have the owner come and say, hey, whatever happened to this job? Oh, it's done. Yeah. Like the ones people talk about are not the good job jobs, yeah. right? So we always wanted a job that flew under the radar. That meant, oh, it went well. And it was, it's a, in many ways, it's a thankless thing that we do right because yeah yeah um, i thought about that i walked through our warehouse across the street earlier today where we store finished goods and it's like we've been in this phase the last couple weeks of all of that we're delivering slightly late we're constantly in crisis mode what can we have ready for delivery tomorrow that kind of thing and then i walk through our warehouse and it's sitting three quarters full of finished goods and it's oh so some of those things (laughs) we've probably been sitting on six weeks that's built ahead those are things to be celebrated and Right. We are doing a lot right. And we're getting close to time here, but I want to make sure that we give people some things to take away, which I think we've, you've given some really good advice here. What are some ways that business owners or company leaders that may be listening can do to help empower their and develop their managers? Maybe even if they realize, hey, I'm myself as a business owner, I know I'm lacking in leadership development. What can they do? to help empower their managers to be able to get the resources they need or the training and development they need. I think some of the most valuable things that I've done to grow in my leadership is getting involved in some of the industry organizations, like we talked about and getting out of the office, going to those industry events, because the people look at the agendas and they think that don't really apply to me. I don't really care that much about that topic, but what you get from those industry events, I would say the majority of your takeaways are going to come from the happy hour conversations or the out to dinner conversations or going for a walk in between sessions, or maybe the session that you skipped altogether and went to the golf course and talked to somebody that's running another business, those peer connections that you make and just fresh perspective on how other people do things has really shaped what I want to do and things that I recognize that I don't want to do. And the other thing is, if you find yourself in a position to where you don't really know how to develop those leaders, I would say shift your focus. You probably get one, one step is get out of those people's way who you've asked to do a job and empower them to do it. And then spend your time focusing on, okay, how do I develop them more? Because you're transitioning your workload to them. So they should take that 
And so in that free space of your day, you need to fill that with, okay, how do I get, how do I get to the next level? And then how do I bring them with me? So we all continue to grow. And, and that can be, I get a ton of content off of LinkedIn, just people that I follow in the industry that are right where I'm at or slightly above me or just in other positions. And so I'm a huge advocate for LinkedIn and all the resources and networking that comes from there. And then the, probably one of the single greatest things that we've done is to invest in those leaders with the third party executive coaching and executive training. And we also meet as a management team once a month. We have a two hour session where we're all meeting as a team with our coach. And then we meet individually with the same coach for an hour. And so it's a big investment, but I think it pays dividends. No, oh, that's awesome. I think that that's great advice. And I th think those resources, one AWI obviously is nationwide yep. and there's other in similar organizations. And then like you mentioned energy, that's the software you guys use, but if you don't use energy, you use other stuff. Yeah. Each software has its own community and they're all really tied together by the industry that we're in Millwork. And this is in many ways, a much bigger industry than I think people realize, but it's way more tight knit and small than it feels. And in the, like, we were just at the AWI Spring Leadership, right? And yep. like, there's so many people that I either have met or have worked with or cross paths with, or just I've seen their name and you know, there are, I don't know, over a hundred or so people there, but those opportunities, like you mentioned, carry on beyond to where it's, hey, I've got this job or this type of question, or this type of problem. And I know John has experience with that. Now we're able to connect and reach out and leverage that networking for as a resource of, hey, John, I can ask you, hey, who is the executive coach you use? I want to have my team maybe do something similar. Yeah. Those opportunities, I think a lot of times this industry is very secretive by nature and almost like everybody keeps themselves, but there's really no reason to. And everybody is very open and willing to share and has a lot of resources to share once they, they cross that threshold. Yeah, I haven't really sensed from anyone in those connections that I've made, you're the competition and we shouldn't be sharing these things. There's probably only a handful of people that are truly competitors with me and we're not fierce competitors even at that. I've shared work. Most of the people who I might get be going up against with bids and stuff are the same people that I'm going to call when my edge bander goes down and be like, right. hey, can I run some parts to you and get them banded this afternoon? And so I've got a company that's 45 minutes from us. We do the same type of work, but um, they come go through our shop. We talk about how we're doing things and things we need to do better. They ran parts for us. Their CNC router went down last month or the month before, and they brought material up here and we ran it for them. And so it, it is very open. I think that's probably a misconception was that, that nobody to, to talk or help anybody out. I've experienced the exact opposite. Everybody has been welcoming and really like to, pour into the industry. I think another factor also might be almost like embarrassment of, I don't want to expose all of my shortcomings and company's problems because everybody else has it together. I think what you find, even as you mentioned here, right? Everybody's really struggling with the same things or has struggled with the same things and nobody has it entirely together. Um, and we're all constantly going through either We've already developed people and now we're developing new people or we're in that process. And like you said, I think everybody's very open and welcome to share. And once you reach out, a lot of times you might be surprised how similar, how many people might have be in a similar place that you are. Yeah. Yeah. I think if you look at that bottom line in the AWI cost of doing business survey, you can gain some peace about probably not <laughs> the industry as a whole does not have it together. Right. It is a, it is by and large an average break even business. And so anything we can do to, to partner up and make the industry better, makes it better for all of us. Yep. Absolutely. Is there anything else that you wanted to share? Any other parting thoughts with our listeners about uh, no work or leadership? I just think that there's as an owner or a leader in an organization, there's nothing more important that you can do than to focus on growing personally and treating other people the way that you want to be treated. 
that'll take you further than anything. And then lastly, just I enjoy these types of conversations. And after the podcast airs, if there's anybody that would like to connect afterwards, I'm happy to have some follow-up conversation and help give back a little bit. I enjoy it and I grow in those conversations as well. So they're not one-sided. I don't know at all. I'll probably learn as much from anybody I talk to as they'll learn from me, but I'd welcome some follow-up conversation. Definitely. And obviously people can reach you through LinkedIn. Yep. We'll be including a link to John's LinkedIn here is probably the best way to reach you, I would imagine. Yeah, that's fine. And we'll have my email address and, and cell phone number too. I'm fine yeah. calling, keep it on me just like about everybody else. <laughs> Those are the best ways to reach me. Well, John, I thank you for your time. And as always, it was insightful and I've really enjoyed your uh, your thoughts on this topic. I've learned some stuff here and uh, appreciate every chance I get to, to spend with you. I hope we, we get to have you on again here before long. Yeah, I really appreciate the opportunity and, and enjoy the time as well. Thanks, John. Thank you. Thank you for listening to today's episode. Do you want to stay up to date about industry insights, new content, and our community of mill workers? Go to duckworksmw.com to sign up for our newsletter. I'll see you in the next episode of Verify in Field.